I mean, this will just scroll for weeks. It is filled with 15,000 games, and it's also incredibly laggy. You don't really want to dive into here and find the games for yourself. Trust me, it's a nightmare. Just let me do it for you. I have dived into the eShop. I found 10 more fantastic eShop games worth buying, and I'm going to show them to you and tell you why you should spend your hard-earned cash. If you enjoy these videos, if they help you out, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what games I should check out next. Let's just talk about some fun eShop stuff. I'm gonna start with Pikmin 1 and 2. And now I know what you're thinking. Yes, there's a physical coming, but it's been digital only this whole time, so screw you. <laughs> some people complain when I put first party IPs on these lists and it's not just indie games, but I never said this was indie eShop games worth buying. I still wanna talk about Nintendo games. Also, even Pikmin can get get buried in a sea of 15,000 games. Both of these GameCube classics are on the Switch, and Nintendo did really nothing to them. They're just on the Switch now. It's literally those old classic games, but in HD. No remake, no remaster, but honestly, if something ain't broke, why fix it? Actually, I lied. They did fix a little bit. The controls are the best they've ever been, with the right analog stick being used to move the camera around, which is the smoothest way of exploring the these games so far. They also did have to go back into the games and remove a lot of the old branding on items you would find and changing them to be more generic fake products. I reviewed Pikmin 4 recently if you want to get a better understanding of this series as a whole. But these games are all about micromanaging armies of Pikmin, keeping them alive while battling massive bugs and other creatures, collecting hundreds of fun, unique treasures around the levels, and fixing up your spaceship so you can hurry up and leave this awful planet. I mean, I don't think it's awful, but I'm sure there's better places. <laughs> Each kind of Pikmin have unique abilities too, and finding new kinds can unlock new areas for exploration, which has always felt really Metroidvania-y. To me. With these games on Switch now, all four Pikmin games are in the same place. And yeah, we don't have to talk about Hey Pikmin. We can leave that on the 3DS. Next, we have Gloomhaven which is not only a fun board game turned video game, but Gloomhaven and Twin Sails Interactive are actually sponsoring this video. They specifically asked to be in one of my eShop videos and I thought that was very nice. <laughs> which actually means that this is the first 10 eShop games worth buying video that has 11 games. Gloomhaven is a tactical RPG with both a solo and online co-op mode. It's developed by Flaming Foul Studios and Saber Interactive and published by Twin Sails Interactive. It is a faithful adaptation of Isaac Childress' board game by the same name. The game has already been live on PC for almost two years, but now it's on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One, Series X, and S, and of course, the Nintendo Switch. The Gold Edition has the base game as well as both DLC packs with over 25 new scenarios, four new unique mercenaries, new enemies, bosses, and items. So I'm playing through another D&D inspired game right now, and this one reminded me of that. When you start, you'll create a team among 17 playable characters, each with their own set of abilities and over 160 missions. For fans of this genre, or even the original board game, Gloomhaven is a perfect pick up to play on the go. So thank you Gloomhaven for wanting a spot in this video. And make sure you click the link below to check out the game. Okay, next. I barely ever get to recommend $5 eShop games in these videos. It is insane to me that Vampire Survivors is this cheap. Also, Rotato. I'm kind of smushing these two into one spot, but they are two different games. The reason why I'm doing it is because Brotato is a clone game of Vampire Survivors, but it offers a lot of different mechanics and I think it stands out on its own. And it's also only $5. Let's start with Vampire Survivors though. Okay, the visual are basic, the controls minimum, but the enemies are endless and the addictiveness is shot straight into my veins. You play as one of the many vampire characters to choose from, most of which you unlock with gold as you progress. Each one has a unique weapon and ability, so pick the one for your playstyle or level that you're playing on. Then, survive. Your weapon will automatically attack for you. All you have to control is where you move. As you kill things, you pick up gems that will level you up, and each time you level up, you can pick a new weapon or ability or an upgrade one of the ones you already have. The waves of enemies will get more and more brutal as time progresses and just like any good roguelike, the key to getting better is failing. Then do better next time. 
using the money earned on a run to upgrade your stats, get new characters and modifiers, and more. It might seem too simple at first, but the real challenge comes in when needing to attack certain tougher enemies to get an item or upgrade drops, or keeping an eye on pickups around the map and timing out the ideal moment to grab a heal or other game-changing item. I have spent countless nights over the last couple of weeks just wanting to play one more game, grinding to unlock a new level, or getting high on the serotonin that is finally getting a perfect run and essentially going god mode on the entire level. And again, Brotato is essentially the same game, but if you were playing as a Mr. Potato Head, come on, Potato Head! The gameplay is actually a twin stick shooter, so you have complete control over where you shoot, rather than it just being random. Rather than leveling up in real time during a long marathon 30 minute level, here you play through minute long waves and at the end you use any points you earn to buy multiple upgrades. The biggest difference I don't like is that you have this flat and limited square play area with physical walls, where in Vampire Survivors you have a never ending map to explore. But either way, five bucks for either of these is a steal. I would go Vampire Survivors first, of course, but if you already love that and want a different take on it, try the Tater Man. Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. It is inspired by Jet Set Radio or Jet Set Grind, Ra Future Jet Grind, something. There's two different names depending on what region you were in. I actually have not played Bomb Rush Cyberfunk yet, but my buddy Bob has, so I asked him if he could review it for me. Bomb Rush Cyber. I've been looking forward to this game because it's basically just Jet Grind Radio. The game feels exactly like a Dreamcast game for better or for worse. I really like it because I grew up with that and I love that style of game. I will say it's a little more Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. It's very focused on doing the tricks and stuff. You enter a new area, you gotta kind of fight that gang and tag over all of their stuff. It's got kind of a warrior's vibe to the story, but I guess so did the original Jack Ryan radio, so it's again the same thing. The music is absolutely incredible, which is a lot of people's reason for wanting this game in the first place. It's the same composer that did the original game, but it comes with it all of the Dreamcast jank. Like the boss fights you do are very basic. The combat is extremely basic. You walk up to the people, do a little spin move and knock them over. The music's awesome, but like some cutscenes just don't have music or sound effects. It's very bizarre. But if you play it as though you're like looking into a time capsule, you'll You'll probably have a really good time. If you're looking for something modern and revolutionary, this ain't it. If you're looking for something nostalgic, something to bring you back to the early 2000s, this is definitely it. It is like $40, but I've been thoroughly enjoying it. I've been playing it on Steam though. I haven't been playing it on Switch. You know what I just realized? Bob really likes Bomb Rush Cyberfunk and Bomber Man. Both of those are essentially his name. Bomb. Have a nice death has everything going for it. A fantastic Tim Burton-esque art style, wonderful animation. The game might look like it wants to be the new Hollow Knight, but it has so much of its own personality and style, it really stands out as a must-play game for fans of this genre. A 2D action roguelike side-scrolling platformer where you play as Death, founder and CEO of Death Incorporated, a company that processes souls for the afterlife. The thing is, his underlings are running wild on Earth, ignoring all kinds of company, protocols and leaving death buried in paperwork. So now it's his job to traverse the various departments of Death Incorporated and just remind his employees who exactly is in charge. The combat is fast and responsive. You got physical scythe weapons to juggle combo your enemies with on each run or other weapons and spells you find on the runs that can add to the chaos. There's also curses to pick up around the level which will boost some of your stats but often with a slight side effect or negative drawback. Many of the levels look like the these beautiful set pieces. The boss battles, for example, being some of the coolest, with the monochrome art style heightening that. The attacks and spells that blast around the screen are brightly colored, both to make it easier to see the enemy attacks, but also because it's just awesome. I'll admit that Have a Nice Death isn't the most polished roguelike game that I've played. I like to feel that every time I start a new run, I'm stronger than the last time. 
but here it's quite a bit more RNG. Runs are easily cut short, either by just getting unlucky in the weapons or upgrades that I found in the run, or getting one hit by a boss that I've managed to beat pretty easily before. But for fans of this genre, the art style and combat is fun enough to give this one a go while we all wait for that damn Hollow Knight 2 Silk Song. Where is it? I don't know. <coughs> I didn't mean to add two side-scrolling platformer Metroidvania games back to back in this video, but you guys know that I had to talk about Blasphemous 2. In my opinion, this is the best 2D souls like that money can buy. It's brutally difficult in the exact same way Dark Souls is. Limited health, a couple of healing flasks, a basic weapon and pixel perfect parry is all you have to start the game. With literally any single enemy being able to wipe you easier than most other games final bosses. With the added fun benefit of every time you die your feather bar which is essentially mana I guess decreases permanently. Well permanently until you want to fix it then you got to go purge your sins which comes at a hefty price tag. The combat feels great. You have a few weapons to choose from at the start and each come with unique abilities for combat and world traversal. Also as you progress you'll collect passives and spells. It's a full tailored adventure down to every fantastically animated pixel which I much prefer when it comes to my metroidvanias. These giant complex puzzles are a joy to solve. Every time you find a new upgrade or power up and unlock a whole previously unexplorable area it feels better than the last. Usually those are only available once taking down a more than ridiculously hard boss fight and what's a souls like without a bonfire? In this game you have altars where you can restore your health and your flasks and if you die you walk back to the last one you are at. And they're very few and far between considering how hard every single screen of this game is. I mean the pixel animations, the soundtrack and the sound effects, the gameplay, even the length of the game at about 25 hours, all of that makes this more than worth the price. Red Dead on the Switch is one of the best ports we have seen in this entire console's run. Thank God, after the travesty that was the GDA trilogy, Red Dead is easily one of my favorite games of all time. Growing up, I loved open world action games, but being a Nintendo kid, I didn't have too much experience with the more mature games. But when I started gaming on my Xbox and PlayStation in my mid to late teens, and then Red Dead dropped, it was an experience experience unlike anything I'd ever played. Well actually it reminded me of this game called Gun that I really liked on GameCube, but this one had a full open world, player choices with an honor system, a movie-esque quality story and cutscene, loads of hidden lore, secrets and characters jam-packed into the world. It felt like a never-ending playthrough. I remember one of my favorite things to do was ride around and find just all the stranger missions, like finding actual Bigfoot, and he was a cool guy. On top of all of that, there was also online multiplayer and an entire side story DLC called Undead Nightmare which featured a whole new what if style story where the zombie apocalypse hit the wild west. And that DLC is packed into the Switch version but the multiplayer isn't. They decided not to do that. I think it's fine. I probably wouldn't have played it anyway. Redemption tells its own story about a man named John Marston, who's kidnapped by the Bureau of Investigation and forced to hunt down his former gang members in exchange for his family's safe return. The sequel, Red Dead 2, which came out 10 years later, is actually a prequel that tells the story of the gang you hunt down later in the first game. It also follows a whole different character called Arthur, who we love so much. So really, this is a unique situation where you could play either the first game or the second game in any order and you'd still have a fine experience. The second game is a lot better, but that does not take away from the first game, which holds up perfectly to this day. Sometimes a game so goofy, so silly, so wacky, so meme -y could end up becoming an instant classic. And that is absolutely the case with Trombone Champ. <laughs> So talented. A rhythm game like no other. Well, I mean, it kind of is like Guitar Hero, but it's not. It's Guitar Hero if the guitar was a trombone and every note sounded like this. <laughs> It's delightfully stupid and utterly hilarious. I mean, sure, it's a huge internet meme game, but it also won awards for Family Game of the Year because it's the best kind of game to play with a crowd watching and laughing along. <laughs> It's almost impossible to make anything sound good, with every attempt sounding more reminiscent of the Jurassic Park theme song played on kazoo. 
for an added challenge, you could even play the game with motion controls. Or if you want to look really inappropriate, you can use the IR motion camera. Almost like you're playing the actual <laughs> instrument. And yeah, you forgot about this thing, didn't you? It's still there. The song selection is mostly royalty free, classical, and some original tracks. And it goes to show just how fun this game is when even playing the American national anthem had me cracking up with my live chat. And that's it. It's pretty simple. It's 15 bucks, but the laughs and memories will last you a lifetime. Oh yeah, the calm before the storm. I feel it coming in the air tonight. Oh no! You know, unless you have no one to play with. And in which case, I recommend just turning the volume up to 11. These go to 11. And annoying the piss out of your neighbors. Gunbrella is not exactly what I expected. I'm not sure what I expected, but I didn't think it would be a Souls-like game. It's got a parry system and it's hard as balls. From the very first encounter with enemies, I found myself dying more times than I do on most full playthroughs of normal games. Published by our friends over at Devolver Digital, Gunbrella starts eerily similar to Demon Slayer with you out in some snowy mountains collecting supplies before coming home and oh you've seen demon slayer now armed with this mysterious umbrella which also happens to be a gun you set out on a bloody and gory adventure to find out what and why this tragic event took place and the movement in the game is very unique you use the umbrella to dash in any direction, and you can hold it open to glide or attach on a zip lines. Then also, shoot it! You can fully rotate the weapon around like a twin stick shooter and use all kinds of ammo to fire at whatever is currently standing in your way. Then, the umbrella can also open up to block attacks or reflect projectiles if timed correctly. The world even manages to feel relatively large and open, with you being able to go around any way you want. There's several towns to visit, all connected by a train system. Lots of characters to meet, even shops to buy and sell things at, or upgrade your gun. It kind of looks like a Metroidvania, but it's not. It's quite linear. You do pick up main and side quests as you explore, which helps the levels feel more full. Visually, I love the neo-noir style with heavy film grain over the top of it. The controls are tight and the boss battles are epic. If you're up for a challenge, try Gunbrella, or should I say... Funbrella. No. I told you guys I was saving the best to last, and a lot of you probably already knew exactly what that was going to be. I'm not sure what the story is behind this dev team, who previously made The Messenger, which we have reviewed before in one of these eShop videos. It was a sick Ninja Gaiden-inspired action platformer, almost achieving perfect scores from multiple outlets across the board. But that is the only other game this development team has made. And now with Sea of Stars, a completely different genre of game outperforming the messenger. Inspired by Illusion of Gaia, Breath of Fire, Super Mario RPG, Golden Sun, and Chrono Trigger, Sea of Stars is an RPG with a beautiful pixel art and animations, charming characters, wonderful music, a fun story, and most of all, engaging gameplay. The turn-based combat utilizes timed action button presses to either get extra damage or extend attacks, with all the moves and abilities looking super flashy and pleasing to watch. Usually, when when an indie team or a third party make a spiritual successor game. They never managed to capture the nostalgia or feeling I had while playing the actual games back in the day, but Sea of Stars really nails it. But it doesn't just mimic or mirror those other older games. It brings so much more of its own depth and new features to make it feel more modern. And it's super well paced too, from solving dungeon puzzles, slugging it out in fights, exploring the world, fishing, meeting people. Nothing outstayed its welcome and it stays engaging the entire time with so many twists and turns in the story that often I didn't even see coming. If you're looking for a classic JRPG Super Nintendo game that never actually got released in the day and now suddenly it's popped up on the Switch eShop, that's Sea of Stars. Not literally, but figuratively. <laughs> I'm still currently playing through it, getting close to the end, but I've had so much fun with it. And that is 10 or 11, maybe 10.5, because Brotato's the same as Vampire Survivor. 
describe as games worth buying on the Nintendo Switch eShop. If you enjoy these videos, let me know down below. Let me know if there's a game that you're definitely picking up today after watching the video. I feel like Vampire Survivors for $5, I hope a lot of you at least try it and grab it because for that price, you can't go wrong. You think about the fact you go to Starbucks and they will literally charge you like $5 for a coffee, for some milk and a little fake shot of espresso, or a whole team of people that worked on a video game for forever. You can just buy that for $5 and play it infinitely. Money is such a weird thing. Yeah, thanks for watching. Love you guys. Bye.